Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, we want to thank God for today and for all those who are visiting us. So those of you who live around, we'll be happy to have you as members of our church. For those of you who have come from other places, may the Lord take care of you. And when you have to return home, may he take you safely. Amen. It's a blessing to be in the house of the Lord, and we want to thank God for the testimonies we have received and the words of inspiration um, that came through the testimonies. When I have any event that is going to bring people together, I pray not just for the success of the event, but I also pray that God will protect everyone who is coming whether you are coming from near or from far. And so I share the blessing that, and thanksgiving that have come from the families who have been bereaved. Both of the funerals have taken place in Kumasi, and people traveled and they came back safely, for which we thank God. Amen. And we pray that wherever life takes us, we will enjoy the blessing and protection of God and our hearts also go out to those who unfortunately have lost their lives in the accidents that have occurred in this country. Um, put off a bit when people um, try to um, uh, turn this into political games, accidents, nobody calls for them. So when it, they happen, we have to pray for families, not try to make political capital out of unfortunate events. So let's continue to pray for the families that God will keep them and comfort them. And of course, we want to pray that those who drive on our roads will also be careful and not bring um, sorrow and pain to families. Having said that, we thank God for what he has done and the ministry of our brother Ken for well, that's his ministry. That's what God has called you to do. So my ministry is to preach and bless you with the word of God so that you can be good citizens and good members of God's kingdom. And your ministry is to watch over the finances. And that also requires God's grace. So I want to thank God. I was very um, delighted when I heard that we're going to conclude the service with uh, Kinky and and Archie. And I, I have already made my choice. Um, I'm going to go for Wache, so <laughs> that's what I want to eat today. So before I left home, I told Theodora, don't leave lunch for me. And she asked me why. Said, I have hope. <laughs> because I heard about it late last night. But I want to assure you that I prepared my sermon before I heard that Ken is back. That I can assure you that I prepared my sermon. So if you hear that my sermon is on purpose in Thanksgiving, I prepared it before I heard about today's, for which, for which that tells you the Spirit is working. <laughs> Praise the Lord. We want to thank God. And our dear brother, Agwili Mensah, is he in church today? No, please extend our congratulations to him. 80 years and still with life and energy. We thank God. So next week, let's come and support our brother. And finally, on Friday evening, we are meeting at 6 o'clock and we'll close at 9. In another church, 6 to 9 will be normal prayer meeting. Here at Asbury is extended. <laughs> so I hope to see you. Pastor John Epipra comes to us from the Church of Pentecost. And he's going to lead us in that service. And of course, there is a ministry retreat the following day. But please come um, for Friday evening, 6 p.m., 9 p.m. I will finish and go. Let us unite our hearts in prayer as we hear God's word. Eternal God, we are grateful to you for our time together this morning. We want to thank you that when we meet, you feed us with your word. You have inspired our spirits, O oh God, 
and our souls with the singing that we have received this morning. We thank you for the vessels that you use to bless us Sunday after Sunday. We thank you for our dear brother, Fifi Simpson, who has so ably led this service. And we thank you for our fellowship. We want to bless your name that those who traveled have come back safely. There are families who are visiting. We have come from far and near, O oh God, to worship, to hear your word, and to be blessed. We pray in the name of Jesus that you will take that which is of you and minister it to us. Bring glory to your own name and bless the ministry of your word. And we ask us in the name of Christ, who is our Lord and Savior. Amen. Praise the Lord. This morning, as I have said, my theme is purpose in thanksgiving. And we have already explained what being purposeful is about. There are certain things that you must do on purpose. You must plan for them and do them. When someone has been good to you, in some way, it is important to give thanks. That's how God created us. God made us such that we will be people who learn to show appreciation. If you are a student, show appreciation to those who take care of you and who pay your fees. Don't take it for granted that because they are your parents or your aunties or your uncles, they have a responsibility to do what they do. They may have that responsibility, but it pleases God when we learn to give thanks. On Thursday, I think it was, I received a telephone call from somebody I have known for many years where the people in the Christian fellowship as leaders when we were growing up. And they live in that city in the western region, Takradi. And he called me and said, ask whether I'll be home on Saturday. I said, yes, I'll be home. He said, I'll come to Accra and I'll come and see you. I assumed that he was coming because he had something to do in Accra and because we hadn't met for a long time, he wanted to come and see me. But actually, they had come with thanks. Because two years ago, this gentleman's granddaughter was coming to study at the university at Legon, and they didn't have, if you like, the resources or something had happened and they couldn't find a hostel. So he called to ask whether we could find some place for his granddaughter at Trinity. I tried, but somehow um, it didn't work for us to get her a place in the seminary facility. So I said, well, come home. Our two um, adult children are out of the house now, so let her come. So she came. And as far as we were concerned, we were just providing space for somebody who needed it. We didn't need the space, don't need that much room, so come. Then the young lady's stay is coming to an end. And so all this travel, all the way from Takura, the four hours to Accra, when they came yesterday at 11 a.m., they said we came with another person just to say thanks. I felt sorry. I said to him, you could have said this over the phone. You didn't come all that way. Of course, I appreciated it, but I felt it was too much to come all the way simply to say thanks. It's good to give thanks. And God wants us to give thanks. If you look at Psalm 103, one of my favorite Thanksgiving Psalms. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and do not forget all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquity? Who heals all your diseases? Who redeems your life from the pit? Who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy? Who satisfies you with good 
as long as you live so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. Amen. Great psalm of thanksgiving from verse 17. It says, but the steadfast love of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to their children's children, to those who keep his covenant and remember to do his commandments. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his kingdom rules over all. Bless the Lord. All you his angels, you mighty ones who do his bidding, obedient to his spoken word. Bless the Lord. All his hosts, his ministers that do his will. Bless the Lord all his works in all places of his dominion. Bless the Lord. Oh, my soul. Amen. It does not mean that everything is going the way you have planned it to go. We have challenges. We have problems. But we still ought to learn to give thanks to God. Thank God for the people who supported you when you were in trouble. Thank God for your friends. They help you to keep your sanity. Thank God for what you consider the insignificant things of life. Because it is part of what makes you human. A child of God must be one who knows how to give thanks. Give thanks for your life. Give thanks for other people. Give thanks for his grace. Amen. That is what Nehemiah did. That is what Nehemiah. We have been learning on purposefulness using the life of Nehemiah. Here was a leader who felt called by God to help rebuild the walls of Jerusalem and restore the dignity of God's people. They had been in exile. In exile, you are a slave. You, you have no rights. You have no privileges. And God had created the opportunity for them to return home. That's what he does for us in Christ. In the world, we are lost. The devil does with us what he likes. But when we are in Christ, Paul says, we are a new creation. So we learn to give thanks for his rescue. And so, Nehemiah had the responsibility of welcoming people from exile and resettling them in their new city, Jerusalem. He faced a lot of problems. We have talked about those. First, he kept reminding himself that it was God who called him. This is not something that he took upon himself. And if it was God who gave the task, then the same God was well able to provide the wisdom, the strength, and the encouragement to accomplish it. Wherever you find yourself, you may be going through the valley of the shadow of death, or so it would seem. But know that if God is on your side, eventually you will triumph. Amen. That is what Nehemiah said. Nehemiah 2.20 The God of heaven is the one who will give us success. We his servants will only start rebuilding. We will do it. It may sound difficult but we will do it. Secondly, at every turn, Nehemiah turned to the Lord in prayer because it's God who called him. He knew that when there were problems he had to turn to God in prayer and prayer does work. That's what as Christians we ought to learn to do. Not only when we are on our knees, but when we are sharing our faith as we heard this morning or when we are in God's presence. God's people ought to learn to be in his presence and we have heard testimonies this morning including one from the minister how off the plane you go to church and prayer is said over you. Nehemiah learned to do that. In Nehemiah 5 verse 19 he makes a direct appeal to God 
to remember him. Remember for my good, oh my God, all that I have done for those people. I have sacrificed my life, my time, my everything, my work in a king's palace to come and help your people. So remember me. It is not out of place to ask God to remember you. Amen? That's what Hannah did. She went to the temple. She made a direct appeal to God. Not that he does not know. God knows. But when you make a direct appeal to him, it's a sign of your submission and trust. So appeal to him on behalf of those who need prayer. And appeal to him on behalf of anyone who has asked you to pray for them. Thirdly, Nehemiah stayed conscious of the fact that his enemies did not give up. And if your enemies have not given up, you don't have to give up yourself. Whether you like it or not, there are people who don't wish you well. The world is like that. There are people who will applaud you when you are doing well. But in their hearts, they wish that you fail. Nehemiah was conscious of that. And in fact, his enemies were relentless in their pursuit. They try one way, they don't succeed, they go another. Sambalat and Tobiah, and there are so many of them around today. At the end of chapter 7 of this book, we see how it looks like everyone contributed to complete the project and the chapter. Chapter 7. At the end of the chapter, it's a very long chapter, verse 7 to 3. It says, and all Israel settled in their towns. Amen. The people saw the fruit of their labor. They settled in their town. In chapter 8, seven months after the project started, people had started settling, which meant God had been faithful. God had accomplished the project. When God is in what you are doing, he also inspires you to continue and he brings success. It is God who will help us to succeed. So when you read chapter 8, I, won't, I can't read everything, it's a long chapter. I'll read just the first six verses. All the people gathered together into the square before the water gate. They told the scribe, Ezra, to bring the book of the law of Moses which the Lord had given to Israel accordingly. Accordingly, the priest Ezra brought the law before the assembly, both men and women and all who could hear with understanding. This was the first day of the seventh month. He read from it, facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday, in the presence of all the men and the women, those who could understand, and the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. The scribe, Ezra, stood on a wooden platform that had been made for the purpose. And beside him stood Mattithiah, Shema, Ananiah, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Marcia, and all his right hand, and Padiah, Michelle, Malchida, Hashum, Hash, Badana, Zachariah, Meshulam on his left hand. Verse 5. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. Then Ezra blessed the Lord. Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. Then they bowed their hearts and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Hallelujah. They gathered. They heard the word of God being read from morning until noon, at least six hours. They were there in the presence of God because they knew what he had done for them. So in chapter 8, which I have read, verses 8 to 5, they called the scribe Ezra to provide some readings from the book of, of the law. Let us call it the word of the Lord. It was important to remind them what God required of them as their sovereign. And I like the reference that they demonstrate, the reverence that they demonstrate toward the word of God. In Hermia chapter 8 verse 5, which I read, when Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, 
he was signed above them, then he opened it. And when you read the end of verse 5, it says, when it opened it, the people stood up. Amen. They stood up in reverence of the word of God. The word of the almighty God is going to be read. It's almost like God himself speaking to them. So they stood up on their feet to hear the word. Then in verse 6, Ezra blessed the Lord and is referred to here as the great God because he had shown himself mighty in their lives. There were times in which when the enemies came upon them, they felt they were losing the battle. But when God is in charge, he brings you out of the deepest pit and enemies are put to shame. Then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And all the people answered, Amen. Amen. They lifted their hands. They bowed their hearts and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. In total submission. When you read further, the portions I didn't read, Nehemiah 8 from 9 to 12, the day then was declared a holy day to set it aside so that every year at this time, we will recognize what God has done. Their circumstances may not have been perfect, but they recognize that the Lord had been good. We are told that as the book of the law of the Lord was read, the people began to weep when you read the rest of the chapter. They wept because they also realized that although they had been able to live up to the high standards of the demands of God, they hadn't been perfect. There were new truths being revealed from God's word and they realized that they hadn't been able to match up to the standard. So they wept. My dear friends, in the midst of the celebration and weeping mixed with rejoicing, there is an expression that is used that if you don't take care, you will miss. The celebrations were led by Nehemiah who was now the governor and Ezra, who is described as priest and scribe. And one of them spoke in Nehemiah chapter 8 and verse 10. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink sweet wine, and send portions of them to those for whom nothing is prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved, and the last phrase in verse 10, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Amen. The joy of the Lord comes from the realization that God does not deal with us as our sins and failures deserve. Thus, as I read in Psalm 103 at the beginning, verses 3 and 4 says, Who forgives all your iniquity and who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good as long as you live, so that your youth is renewed like the eagles, which means your weakness will be turned into strength. For us today, the joy of the Lord will refer to the contentment that we have in Christ. It could also be the sufficiency. Christ is our sufficiency. The joy of the Lord is to know that your life and affairs are in the hands of a sovereign God. In Nehemiah, he's referred to as the great God who ultimately is the source of your strength. Paul says in Acts 17, 28, for in him we live and move and have our being. Hallelujah. So, purposeful thanksgiving means being conscious about giving thanks. It's to come to that point in life in which you simply live a life of gratitude because you know that the joy of the Lord is your strength. Your strength, your inspiration comes from 
the joy that you have that God is your savior. The joy of the Lord is my strength. In the midst of your pains and difficulties and disappointments, there must surely be specific things for which we must find reason to be thankful. On a daily basis, let us ask ourselves, do I have something to be thankful for? At the end of the rebuilding project, Nehemiah was not fixated on people like Sanballat and Tobiah who persecuted them. Those names did not even feature in their discussions, if you read chapter 8. They only brought the people together, showed them what the Lord had done, how undeserving they were of his grace, and the need to celebrate. The joy of the Lord is my strength. In other words, as people focus on the difficulties of life and how to pursue their enemies and destroy them, I will focus on what the Lord has done and declare continually that the joy of the Lord is my strength. Let me conclude by reading Nehemiah 8, 6 again. Then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen, Amen, lifting up their hands. Then they bowed their hearts and worshipped. They worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Then you get to verse 10, and it says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Can you say that to yourself? The joy of the Lord is my strength. Shall we go again? The joy of the Lord is my strength. For the last time, the joy of the Lord is my strength. So go in peace and be purposeful in the way you give thanks to God. Shall we pray? And just for a few moments, thank God for something. Thank God for something. You have a job. Thank God for it. If you don't have a job, you have life. At least you have some qualification. Thank God for it. You have a brother. You have a sister. You have somebody whom you can call on the phone. Somebody has helped you in some way. You have life. Maybe you are even living with some disability or some ailment. At least you are taking medication. And the medication may be working. Thank God for that. Because there are people whose diseases, illnesses have not even been diagnosed. So they don't even know what medication to take. Thank God for something. And don't focus on those who want to destroy you. Focus on the goodness of the Lord. Focus on the goodness of the Lord. And give thanks. Give thanks. Give thanks. Father and our God, we want to thank you that we are together in your presence. We want to thank you for your word. We want to thank you for our fellowship and all the things that you do for us, no matter how small. We've not had all our expectations and needs met, but we know that as long as you remain sovereign, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is with us in the presence of your Spirit, you will come through for us. So this morning, as we lift up your people with all kinds of needs and anxieties to you, we pray that in the midst of the quagmas of life, your children will have the peace that comes from being thankful. Help us to leave this place this morning with the spirit of thanksgiving for everything that you have done for us, for what you do for us through other people. And we pray when we sit down to eat, when we sit down to drink, Lord, help us to be thankful. We want to thank you for the provision that has been made for us today to share in the joy of fellowship 
fellowship at the table. We extend the prayer to the meals that we are going to take this morning. Bless it and bless our time together. Your word tells us it is more blessed to give than to receive. So bless the families that are giving us of this. Bless each one of us and help us to share our joys together. We pray that when it's time to go home, help us to be thankful. Not to focus on the difficulties that face us, but to rejoice in the God who has promised to come through for us. And we pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.